Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. Whether you are sitting here with us in the sanctuary or worshiping with us via live stream, it's good to be together in community this morning. I'm Pastor Joy Fenton-Jones. Know that um, whether you are a first-time visitor with us this morning or if this has been your church home for many years, you are so very welcome here. It is our practice at the beginning of worship to give ourselves the gift of a moment. We recognize that we all come from different places, different experiences. We walk in with different moods and different energy levels on Sunday morning. This morning, we are going to take that minute. We're going to take that time of prelude, but we are going to give it a little special purpose today. Uh, I want to share with you that a dear and beloved friend of this congregation, uh, Bob Hively, passed away on Friday evening around 930. We have some of his family here with us this morning, and they shared a couple of hymns that were Mr. Hively's very favorite hymns. So for our prelude this morning, I want to invite you to turn in your hymnal, if you would like to, to number 452, or you'll find the words up on the screen. We are going to sing together one of Mr. Hively's favorite hymns for our prelude this morning, Here I Am, Lord. They're actually just in your hymnal. Just in the to, hymnal. Yes. Thank you, Beth. Yes, okay. If you want to sing along, open your hymnal. 452. Number 452 in the hymnal. Thank you.
like to invite you to stand now as you're able, whether that's in body or in spirit, and we are going to speak together our responsive call to worship. I'll invite you to stand. Forgive us, O God, for we have envied other people who have more than we do. We have desired their comfort and their toys and their easy living more than we have desired your glory. Forgive us, O God, for we have twisted the gospel to serve our own ends. We have suggested that wealth equals holiness and might equals right. Give us wisdom, O God, to trust in the gospel. Help us resist jealousy and walk humbly with you. Amen. Well, we have a fabulous opening hymn this morning. You might want to open up your hymnal for a little guidance. It's number 623. Uh, this is a wonderful gospel hymn, Woke Up This Morning, and we'll sing all three verses. excellent job with that. Very nice. You may be seated. We come now into a time of sharing our joys and our concerns so that we can support each other in prayer. And Kylie has our microphone. She's going to bring it around to anyone um, who would like to share a joy or a concern this morning. But Kylie, I'm going to ask if you would go over to Mr. Will Hively first this morning. I know that he has a few words that he would like to share with the congregation today. I am uh, Will Bob Hively's son. I'm here from New Hampshire with my sister Jane from New York and her husband, Bob Barber. Uh, I really wanted to be here this morning. Um, the reason is um, you heard the news. My father passed away after a major stroke. As peacefully and comfortably as humanly possible, I would say. Um, with the wonderful care of the hospice people at SEMA. Um, just a week ago, today he was his normal self. And by Friday he was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the news. Most of you already know probably. Um, I came here to say something in remembrance of him and also to express some gratitude. As far as remembrance, um, I'm here now because this church and this congregation was so important to him and he devoted so many hours mm -hmm. to all of the activities and all, all of the problems and joys of his community for a very large number of his 101 years. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he, I don't want, I can't name all the things he did, all the people he helped. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know he was 
in my memory, a treasurer, an adult Sunday school mm -hmm. leader, um, a, a, an elder, and I'm told an elder, what was it, emeritus. <laughs> yes. Um, which sounds to me like quite an honor. Um, <laughs> and I, I feel at present mm -hmm. like I can say an hour. Um, what I want to prayers, many visited, many helped him in his innumerable ways that he could need help or said that I wouldn't. And I can't even, I, I know, I think too, I know some of you are, are um, remotely attending. Um, you know who you are, and um, I don't know who all of you are myself. Thank you so much for those words, Will. Are there other joys or concerns that you would share this morning so that we can hold one another in prayer as a community? Rosemary. Um, it was my birthday on Wednesday. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Um, Helen couldn't be here today, but she sends her thanks for everyone who sent her well wishes in the mail or came to her party on Friday. It was fun to see um, a, a very quiet child mm. who has kind of made a difference for us. Mm. So. Thank thanks, you. Christy. Thank you. Jerry in the back. It's also Steve's birthday today. He's slightly older than Rosemary. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who prayed for my mom. She had surgery on Friday and everything went really well. She's home and I was spending a few days with her, but I told her I was coming here and not to lift anything heavy. <laughs> Would you join me in the spirit and attitude of prayer this morning? Gracious God, we come before you this morning. And I think we are just particularly mindful of your presence this morning, and especially the way that you work through the lives of unique and incredible and wonderful people to touch our lives, uh, to invite us to grow, to invite us to uh, grow in grace and in love for one another. Um, this morning, we just begin with a tremendous prayer of thanks for the life of Bob Hively. We have heard these touching words uh, from Will, and um, as beautiful as they were, they capture only a small fragment of the reality of what his life and his personhood has meant to this congregation and this community. So we thank you for him this morning. We thank you for his life, and we thank you for the very obvious way that his legacy and his impact live on um, and will live on very far past his already impressive 101 years. Uh, we ask that you would inspire our hearts um, to emulate his example and to think how we might indeed uh, be a little more like him in some of the ways that we interact with one another, in the ways that we uh, pursue creativity and knowledge, the ways that we seek to grow and better ourselves every single day of our lives. We thank you this morning for him and for his example. 
we have some other folks in this community who are celebrating milestones right now, and we lift them up to you as well with prayers of gratitude. Um, we celebrate with Rosemary as she is going to celebrate another year on Wednesday. We are grateful for her life, for her presence in this community, for the ways that she pitches in and helps on Sunday mornings, uh, the ways that her smile and her cheerful attitude are a blessing to this community. We're blessed to have her here, and so we celebrate with her as she turns the page uh, to another year, and we pray that it will be full of blessings ahead. We thank you this morning for Steve, for the way that his servant heart and his grace is a gift to this congregation. Um, we ask also that you would just fill the year ahead with blessing for him, that it would be full of uh, new adventures and a lot of blessings. We're grateful uh, for the milestone that Helen has passed with her graduation and um, really touching to hear Christy remind us that you know, quiet folks have a huge impact on us and touch our lives as well. And to recognize what a difference she has made in the lives of so many around her. We just thank you for her, for her hard work, um, for all the effort that brought her to this milestone. And we just ask that you would continue uh, to bless her and bless her life as she moves forward into the next chapter. We have a couple of young people who are headed off to camp um, to precious, energetic young people. So we just surround Kylie and Addie with our prayers that this would be a week full of blessing where they would make new friends, where they would solidify relationships they already have, uh, where they would have a lot of fun, uh, learn new things about you and about their relationship with others, um, and that they would just come back telling awesome stories about how they experienced your love and your presence this week at Otter Camp. We are grateful to hear this morning that Linda has come through back surgery well, that she is home and that she's recovering. We ask that you would just continue to surround her with a sense of your peace and comfort and patience as she takes step by step um, and makes step by step progress to get back to being 100%. We uh, thank you for a good report, for that answer to prayer. We ask that you would just continue to be present with her as she heals. God, as we come before you this morning, we recognize that we all carry a lot of things in our own hearts. We do not always choose to say them aloud. So we would simply keep silence before you this morning and simply ask that you meet each one of us right where we are. It is in a spirit of hope and grace and love that we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to conclude this prayer time by singing together one more of Mr. Hively's favorite hymns. You can find it in your hymnal at number 227 or on the screens. We'll sing together in the garden.
Our psalm reading this morning is Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. They drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We come now to our children's moment, and our scripture reading in just a moment prompted me to read you one of my very favorite children's books. I could not resist, but I think due to the trickiness of trying to hold a mic and read a story, I'm going to share it with you from right here, but I'm going to invite our children and our young people to come on up, and I'm going to read the story here where I have a mic, and then I'll come down, and we'll just talk a little bit about it. I also want to make sure our folks on the live stream, thank you, can actually hear so this story is called The Sneetches. It is a lesser known story by the beloved Dr. Seuss. Now, the star belly Sneetches had bellies with stars and the plain belly Sneetches had none upon bars. Those stars weren't so big. They were really so small, you might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But, because they had stars, all the star belly sneeches would brag, we're the best kinds of sneech on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort, we'll have nothing to do with those plain bellied sort. And whenever they met, when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. When the star belly children went out to play ball, could a plain belly get in the game? Not at all. You could only play if your bellies had stars and the plain belly children had none upon bars. When the star belly sneeches had frankfurter roasts or picnics or parties or marshmallow toasts, they never invited the plain belly sneeches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away, never let them come near, and that's how they treated them year after year. Then one day, it seemed, while the plain belly sneeches were moping and doping alone on the beaches, just sitting there wishing their bellies had stars, a stranger zipped up in the strangest of cars. My friends, he announced in a voice clear and keen, my name is Sylvester McMonkey McBean, and I've heard that. I'm a fix-it-up chappy. I've come here to help you. I have what you need, and my prices are low, and I work at great speed, and my work is 100% guaranteed. Then quickly, Sylvester McMonkey McBean put together a very peculiar machine, and he said, you want stars like a star belly sneech? My friends, you can have them for $3 each. Just pay me your money and hop right aboard. So they clambered inside, and the big machine roared, and it clonked, and it bonked, and it jerked, and it burked, and it popped them about, but the thing really worked. When the plain belly sneeches popped out, they had stars. They actually did. They had stars upon bars. Then they yelled at the ones who had stars at the start, we're exactly like you, you can't tell us apart. We're all just the same now, you snooty old smarties, and now we can go to your Frankfurter parties. Good grief, groaned the ones who had stars at the first, we're still the best sneeches and they are the worst, but now how in the world will we know, they all frowned, if which kind is what or the other way round. Then up came McBean, with a very sly wink, and he said, things are not quite as bad as you think, so you don't know who's who, that's perfectly true, but come with me, friends, do you know what I'll do? I'll make you again the best sneech on the beach, and all it will cost you is $10 each. <laughs> Belly stars are no longer in style, said McBean, what you need is a trip through my star off machine. This wondrous contraption will take off 
your stars, so you won't look like Sneetches who have them on theirs. And that handy machine working very precisely removed all the stars from their tummies quite nicely. Then with snoots in the air, they paraded about and they opened their beaks and they let out a shout, we know who is who, now there isn't a doubt, the best kind of Sneetches are Sneetches without. Then of course, those with stars all got frightfully mad. To be wearing a star was now frightfully bad. Then of course, old Sylvester McMonkey McBean invited them to his star off machine. Then of course, from then on, as you probably guessed, things really got into a horrible mess. All the rest of that day, on those wild, screaming beaches, the fix-it-up chapty kept fixing up Sneetches. Off again, on again, in again, out again, through the machines, they raced round and about again, changing their stars every minute or two. They kept paying money, they kept running through. Until neither the plane nor the star bellies knew whether this one was that one, or that one was this one, or which one was that one, or what one was who. Then, when every last cent of their money was spent, the fix-it-up chappy packed up, and he went. And he laughed as he drove in his car up the beach. They never will learn. Nope, you can't teach a sneech. But McBean was quite wrong. I'm quite happy to say that the sneeches got really quite smart on that day. The day they decided that sneeches are sneeches and no kind of sneech is the best on the beaches. That day, all the sneeches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon theirs. So I will come down for a moment. I know this is always kind of a long children's moment, but I trust you'll all forgive me. So anybody kind of get the point of that story about sneeches? So some of them had stars and some of them didn't have stars. And what happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Uh huh. Yes. So we got a nice ending to this story, didn't we? So that's good. But the process was not so good, right? Of being jealous of these sneeches and wanting to look like those sneeches and wasting a lot of energy and a lot of money just trying to be like the sneeches with the stars or without the stars. Um, it's a little bit like the story we're gonna hear in just a minute from Genesis. We have two brothers who were just different. They had different gifts, different things they were good at, and it led to some jealousy. And our story today doesn't have quite such a good ending, but I think it reminds us Whenever I read the speeches, it reminds me um, to appreciate the way that each one of us is, the way that we're unique, and the way that we're special, and to try our very best to just be confident in who we are and not worry too much about um, how other folks are different from us and also special the way they are. So let's take a moment, if we can, to pray. Will you repeat after me? Gracious God, we thank you for the way you've made each of us. Help us not to be jealous of the way you've made other people, but to be confident in the special way you've made us. Amen. Our Hebrew Bible reading this morning comes from the beginning of Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read the first 16 verses this morning. Now the man, we often call him Adam, knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, 
and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, today we pick up the second installment of our new sermon series, In the Beginning, a fresh look at Genesis that will hopefully inspire us to think somewhat more wisely and deeply about the art of being in healthy relationship with God and with others. Last week, we kicked off the series with the mythical story in Genesis 3 that supposedly put the initial wedge in place between God and humanity. Often simply called the fall, it is that story in which woman trusts a wily serpent over her own best instincts, eats some fruit she was commanded not to eat, shares it with her husband, and with that seemingly minor act of disobedience, apparently derailed harmony and happiness for the rest of us for all time. All glibness aside, we considered that the story in Genesis 3, far from being historically or literally accurate, does hold some guiding principles that must have been as apparent to ancient folks as they are to us. First of all, we noted that insecurity does not help our relationships with God or with others. As people of faith, we use language about having been created in the divine image. Indeed, we claim to have a bit of God, the Holy Spirit, our love and appreciation for Jesus within our very beings. And yet from the beginning, we have struggled to rest secure in who we are. Some sense of lack or inadequacy led those first mythical humans to eat from a tree on the promise of obtaining something they'd already been given. We too strive sometimes to fill ourselves or adorn ourselves with unnecessary trappings to prove or demonstrate our worth rather than recognizing our inherent uniqueness and value simply as the people we are. Second, we observed that when we do make mistakes, shame also often leads us to run and hide instead of standing out in the open, being honest, and doing what needs to be done to repair damaged relationships. Once man and woman eat of that forbidden fruit, they hide from God, which I will remind you means hiding from a part of their very own nature. Disconnected and in internal disarray, the situation devolves further. Finally, when God and humanity do meet for an opportunity at reconciliation, a blame game ensues. The man blames the woman, the woman blames the snake, and the snake seems already to have left the building. In the end, everybody's just punished. Punishments we saw last week may have attempted to answer some of the tough questions ancient people faced in their day-to-day -day lives. Insecurity, shame, blame. Three admittedly human qualities that stand in the way of our desire for healthy relationships. In their place, we propose a secure sense of identity and openness and a sense of responsibility for our inevitable mistakes as those qualities that enable us to begin crafting solid relationships. 
As we will see today, the stories of Genesis are somewhat cumulative. Lessons learned in one story remain applicable as we move through others. I am drawing some inspiration for this series from a book by Karen Armstrong that is also titled In the Beginning. In her introductory chapter, Armstrong, Armstrong writes this. A reading of Genesis suggests how it was that psychoanalysis began as a predominantly Jewish discipline. Long before Freud, the authors of ancient Israel had already begun to explore the uncharted realm of the human mind and heart. They saw this struggle with their emotions and with the past as the theater of the religious quest by seeking reconciliation with the people who have damaged them in the past and by attempting to resolve their own inner conflicts men and women would sense that harmony and peace which characterize the sacred. Let me say a little bit of that again in plain English. When we learn to heal broken relationships in our past, and when we figure out how to achieve some inner peace about it all, we find the sacred, the divine that we are looking for. Armstrong continues, Yet precisely because the authors of Genesis are dealing with such fundamental and difficult matters, they give us few precise teachings. There are no glib or easy messages in Genesis. It is impossible to find a clear theology in its pages. The authors share no moral consensus, and some have ethics which we would find highly dubious today. There are no paragons in these tales, and even God's behavior occasionally leaves something to be desired, end quote. This brings us solidly to our story this morning, another epic mythological tale couched in a theme we all know very well, sibling rivalry. If you have a sibling, or even if you don't, you know what it looks like when a sense of competition springs up between children or teenagers or spouses or partners or colleagues at work. We have all been there in one form or another. My life currently entails navigating the inexplicable behaviors and mood swings of an energetic two-year-old who about a quarter of the time his one-year-old brother comes within arm's length, gives him a firm shove such that poor Declan lands on his little backside with a thud. Xander only performs this delightful maneuver when I am around, so I'm fairly well convinced it is his inappropriate two-year-old way of saying, back off, little bro, I was here first. <laughs> Sadly enough, I'm not sure we entirely outgrow this sort of behavior in adulthood. We just find more sophisticated ways to shove each other. Our story from Genesis 4 also revolves around two brothers, men the story names Cain and Abel. We are told very little about these two other than that they were born of that first mythical man and woman. We meet them only in adulthood. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground, the text states. Both of these men clearly possessed some sense of the divine and a desire to interact appropriately with the divine presence. So when they reach some measure of success in their respective careers, they each bring an offering to God. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock. That sounds reasonable enough if we accept that offerings of this sort were standard practice in keeping one's God happy. Then the story takes a rather inexplicable turn. We are given no context and no rationale when the authors of Genesis write that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. Seems a little unfair. The text continues, so Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. I can't say I blame him. The guy was a farmer and he brought the best of his harvest as an offering. His brother happened to be an animal guy, so his brother brought that sort of offering. Even if we are to presume that God simply preferred meat, even your average human being is gracious enough to say something like, it's the thought that counts. There is no moral or ethical reason for God to find one offering acceptable and not the other. 
Then God seems to add insult to injury, saying to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, then sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. It's as though God simply responds, tough luck, bud, and further chastises Cain for having a bad attitude. So Cain says to his brother, let's take a walk. And when they have walked far enough for Cain's comfort, he rises up against his brother and kills him. I have a visceral reaction at this point in the story. Things have just gone haywire. We started out like three sentences ago with two decent sounding guys. Nobody did anything categorically wrong. Nobody ate any forbidden fruit. Nobody colluded with any serpents. Nobody broke anything or stole anything or even said anything mean. These two brothers brought the best they had to God, exactly the sort of disposition we imagine we are supposed to have, except one of them receives affirmation and the other one gets a raw deal. If I'm mad at anybody in this story, I'm mad at God. Why couldn't you just be fair? This whole mess could have been avoided. Now we've got an irreparably fractured relationship between two brothers, since one of them is dead on the ground. And if we read the rest of the passage, we see that Cain's relationship with God is irreparably damaged as well. Cain is cursed from the ground, the text says. God further promises when you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You'll be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. There are a couple of sensible points to be made about all this, but first, I just have to say, unfair, unfair, unfair. Why should Abel have gotten a pat on the back for his offering and Cain received criticism for trying just as hard? It's not fair. Now, I ask you today, who among us has not felt this way? We look around at the world often and we find ourselves saying, this is not fair. Bad people get ahead. Unethical politicians win. People cheat and they get away with it. Liars and thieves prosper. Children get shot. Women with heart-wrenchingly difficult decisions to make can't get medical care. And good, hardworking people struggle. It's not fair and do not ask me to have a good attitude about it. We might as well be honest and admit that if we're gonna hold God directly responsible for every little thing that happens in our world, God has a lot of explaining to do. This is exactly how these stories, these pieces of mythology get us right between the eyes. In our shared humanity, we can recognize the deep truths in a story like this one even as we know it is not literally or historically or factually true, we know exactly what it feels like to envy our brother, whether that's our literal brother who for some reason just seems to be able to afford nicer cars and vacations than we can, or human siblings in other forms who just seem to get ahead for less honorable reasons while we're working our butts off and getting nowhere. And guess what, friends? God doesn't fix it all. So I guess we can get mad at God, but our story this morning suggests that our anger might be both misplaced and unproductive. What early humanity learns through this tough, rather unfair bit of myth is that however fair or unfair life may be, we do have some responsibility for how we're going to respond to it. We can find ways to make peace, or we can find ourselves in a perpetual trap of disappointment and anger. We might, may not actually go and harm anyone, much as we might like to sometimes, but it leaves us hopelessly distant from God and from our fellow human beings nonetheless. When God, who we might as well call life or circumstance in this particular story, confronts Cain, we see a response similar to that we heard from the woman in the garden last week. God asks, where is your brother Abel? Cain says, I don't know, it wasn't my job to look after him. In other words, not my fault. On top of his anger and jealousy and murder, we have a refusal to be honest 
or admit responsibility. And so Cain finds himself even further from God's presence. As a little bit of an aside, whenever I teach this story, I feel I would be remiss not to point out the very real and irreparable harm that often occurs when we do embrace a literal reading of a text. For many years in this country, it was white evangelical Christians in particular who quoted scripture, invoked Jesus' name, and prayed in the power of the Holy Spirit that they might be able to continue to exclude, abuse, and murder people simply for having darker skin tones. If you want to talk about something unfair, it was this very text, among others, that was used to justify widespread church-sanctioned bigotry, and hatred. After Cain is banished to wander the earth, he cries out to God that that punishment is more than he can bear. God responds, finally, with a measure of mercy and places a mark on Cain such that anyone who encounters him might know he's protected by God and spare his life. Ill-intentioned white people twisted this text and imagined that this so-called mark of Cain was, in fact, the dark pigment typical of persons of African descent. In an absurd reading of this text, these Christian people extrapolated that the mark, which is placed only on Cain in the story, could reasonably be assumed to have been genetically passed down to all of Cain's descendants, which is nonsense right off the bat. But that insane reading of scripture was used to justify the brutal treatment of black people in this country on the grounds that their kind were responsible for the first murder and therefore inherently more violent and less civilized than white people. Scripture, much like any other treasured document, must be read with nuance, with some knowledge of history, and for heaven's sake, with a boatload of grace. When we find ourselves interpreting any of our precious documents in such a way as to harm or pass judgment on our fellow human beings, we as Christians should be the first ones to stand up and say, no way. But I digress, or perhaps dissent. The bottom line is that life is unfair. Inequality and injustice feel baked into our humanity sometimes, and we have all had moments in which we despaired of things ever being any different. Furthermore, it does feel like God is complicit sometimes, or at least like God isn't exactly rushing to our defense. If God is so all-knowing and all-powerful, why do some people live in luxury while others starve? Why do good people face hardship after hardship while unethical people get rich? Why is life so darn unfair? We find ourselves right where we began, with the recognition that Genesis does not offer us easy answers to life's most profoundly difficult questions. What it offers us is hard, battle-tested wisdom. That when we do face life's unfairness squarely in the face, we have choices. We can descend into a murderous rage, proverbially speaking, or we can try to find some measure of grace. It would seem the former choice only destroys us from the inside without accomplishing any great good in the world. And the latter choice, to choose grace, well, it's hard. There's a final detail in this story that I don't want to overlook. For all his obvious faults, Cain is a murderer after all, he also becomes the father of civilization. It is Cain who has the fortitude to venture out and settle and start a family in a new land, eventually bringing forth, quote, those who lived in tents and had livestock, those who played the lyre and pipe, musical instruments, and those who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Karen Armstrong writes, by attributing the civilized arts to the descendants of Cain, the restless wanderer, the Bible recognized that civilization is built as well as destroyed by anger and discontent. Much of our God-given energy can erupt in creativity and the life-enhancing arts, as well as in uncontrolled hatred and egoism. The secret is to learn how to master and channel the power that lies coiled at the root of our nature. 
Instead of using it like Cain to destroy, we can deflect it and make it a source of blessing. There is plenty in this world about which to be angry. All is not fair. All is not well. God's precious children are not all treated with equity and justice. We have an opportunity to take our righteous anger and our indignation and channel it toward some good. Not everybody chooses to do that, and it doesn't feel fair. But if we are to pursue and maintain right relationship with God and with each other, we must do just that. Amen. We come now into a time of responding to God's spirit and God's word. One of the ways we do that is through the sharing of our tithes and offerings. Kylie is going to walk the plate down and back. We are not passing it in the pews right now, uh, but it will come down the center aisle and back if that is comfortable for you. I also want to remind you this morning that money is just one of a whole bunch of ways that we respond to the presence of God's spirit in our own hearts. So as we sing our offertory song, Be Thou My Vision, I would invite you to be uh, attentive to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your own heart in whatever form that might take. me our unison prayer of dedication on the screen. Almighty God, you bless us so richly. You renew us and give us new life. You equip us with the gifts of your spirit. You give us an amazing calling to follow you each day. But sometimes we fail to use the gifts you've given us. We complain that we don't have enough. We covet after things we don't need. Please help us see how you've already blessed us as we commit these tithes and offerings to your service. Amen. You may be seated. As we come now into our time of sharing communion, I'll remind you of just a couple of things. First of all, um, here at First Christian Church and at all Christian churches, we practice an open table. That means you do not need to be a member of this or any church to share in communion this morning. All are truly welcome at this table. I will also share with you that we are going to receive communion by means of coming down the center aisle. There will be one station in the middle with the bread. Uh, you can receive and eat the bread and then proceed to either of the two stations, receive the cup, and then head back to your seats by the side aisle. 
In preparation for communion, we'll sing together Care's Chorus. You can find the words on the screen or in the praise binder in your pews, and we'll sing it twice through. Our Lord invites to this table all who desire wholeness in a world that so often feels fractured and unfair. Around this table, we freely admit that all is not yet right in the world. Events unfold around us that leave us fearful, frustrated, angry, and even jealous. This communion table is not magic. It does not fix everything in a moment or promise us easy answers to complex problems. We will leave this table, and we will still sometimes experience fear and frustration, anger and envy. This table does offer us a vision of the sort of grace that enabled Jesus to share the bread and the cup, even with someone who would later betray him. This table does offer us the promise of forgiveness, even when we give in to our jealousy and our anger. This table does offer us the promise that God's presence sticks with us no matter how daunting life feels sometimes. As we break the bread today, we are reminded it represents Jesus' willingness to face suffering in his own body in order that others might live freely in the abundance of spirit we call eternal life. He endured suffering so that we might understand our own innate worth and be freed to live our lives unthreatened and secure. As we share the cup today, we are reminded it represents a promise that we can never be separated from the love of God. No matter how depraved our human behavior at times, no matter how bleak, the landscape may appear, no matter how frustrating the inaction of those we believe could make change, we know that neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Beth, will you pray for us? Dear God, in this time when it feels like every day is a new problem around us, either worldly, locally, or personally, please God be with us. Remind us to cast our cares upon you, to lay our burdens down at your feet, for you will guide us, comfort us, and renew our spirit. May this meal be a renewal of our body, mind, and soul, that you are ever present in this uncertain world. Bless this bread and this cup to nourish us to do your will. In your name we pray. Amen.
have just a couple of announcements for you. First of all, I will remind you that we are endeavoring to keep a record of attendance. So if you are willing to just jot your name and how many folks are with you this morning, uh, we would love to receive that from you. You can just leave those up here on the podium at the conclusion of the service. It just helps us to know who is worshiping with us each Sunday. I want to remind you that we have a special conversation today following the service. We have called this a congregational conversation. We're going to meet for about 30 minutes, and we're going to be doing some discernment uh, about our future life together. So um, members and friends of this church, you are very welcome to stay for that conversation following the service. Um, Charlie, we can kick the slide forward a couple. I think we've got one up there. Yes, our all-church discussion today after worship. I'll remind you that the car show is ongoing on Mondays. We have got uh, tomorrow that will be here. We are off for the 4th of July, and then we pick back up on July 11th and continue through the rest of the summer. Uh, it's been going great. If you are willing to volunteer, we would always love to have an extra pair of hands, and you can see Connie uh, for that sign-up sheet following the service. And finally, as we said during our prayer time, Otter Camp is this week. Kylie is on her way there. Our office administrator, Sarah Neary, her daughter a a Addie, excuse me, is on her way there. So let's hold them in our prayers this week and know that if you would like to send a piece of camp mail, that would be awesome and you are welcome to do so. With those announcements before us, I'm going to invite you once again to stand as you're able, whether in body or in spirit, and we'll close by singing together number 636, the first two verses of Abide With Me. received a little note here, and I would be remiss if I did not share with you that today is Virginia Hook's 100th birthday. My goodness, are we not blessed with some incredible saints <laughs> in this congregation? So I lift up that uh, word of celebration and for her long and wonderful life this morning. I invite you to go from this place in a spirit of hope. We know that all is not yet right in the world, but we believe that God is not yet finished with things, and we have work to do. So let's get out there together and let's do it, friends. Amen. <laughs>